Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn is the Bishop of Dallas, the South, and the Bulgarian Diocese. He is a monk of Simona Petra Monastery on Mount Athos, where he was the disciple of the great elder Emilianos. Uh, he is also a graduate of Oxford University, where he wrote his monumental doctoral dissertation on St. Dionysius the Areopagite. Archbishop Alexander is a wonderful archpastor, and he's, as you'll see, a uh, fine scholar. So without further ado, I hope you'll enjoy this episode from my interview with His Eminence Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn. Father Emilianos is the reason I'm sitting here. And probably the reason I'm an archbishop, since I'm sitting here as an archbishop. The reason that I continue to Christian. He was abbot of the monastery of Simonos Petrus from 1973 to mid-90s, when he had to step down because of an illness which had severely uh, affected his thought processes and ability to communicate. He was an Athenian born. One or both of his parents, I think, were from Asia Minor. They had, had, they had been thrown out in the population exchange of 1924. And had resettled in the Greek monarchy. Raised by a very especially devout grandmother who would wake him up at midnight for vigil and read to him out of saints' lives, among which, interestingly, was the life of Saint Herman, probably from a Russian source book of the late 19th century that had been translated into Greek sometime in the interval. He went to theological education at Athens, and I think by the time he was through, had concluded that things in the Greek church were hopelessly stale and flat, that they had to change. And he thought maybe the Western orders had the right idea. But in the interval, he had met the Bishop of Larissa, that's kind of north central Greece, Dionysius, who had been a monk at Mount Athos, who had suffered in Dachau. Um, and who had impressed the young Alexander, that was Emilianos' original name, who said, no, 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 come up to me, and I'll ordain you, and I'll make you preacher and teacher in our schools, and let me help guide you. And being very impressed with the man, he did so, very successfully, he gathered a kind of small legion of disciples from the high schoolers that he had been teaching, uh, both male and female. These would become, in fact, the cores of both his monastery, the women's monastery and the men's. And then the old bishop said to him, now I want you to go and restore monastic life to the monastery of Great, of great Meteora. which was a ruin and inhabited by the people of the most doubtful sort. So he had, the young abbot had to go up, clear these people out, and then sit alone on top of this crag, literally on top of a crag, a column of stone, alone. 
And he did so for some years until the young people whom he had so impressed as a teacher of catechetics in the high schools began to ask to be tonsured, both the young boys and the young girls. So two monasteries formed, a men's monastery around him on top of Meteora and a women's monastery in one of the empty other empty monasteries of Meteora region. And eventually this community moved to the to Madathos when they when they were felt overwhelmed by touristic pressures because the government was pushing Meteora as a major touristic center. And they felt they had to go somewhere where they weren't simply museum curators but could live the monastic life. And the women moved to the middle finger of the Halkidiki Peninsula at its base, a town called Ormelia, where they have a monastery of over a hundred nuns present day. Now, at Simonos Petrus, when I came to know him, there were certain very clear emphases in Father Menios' teaching. One that was instantly obvious to me, the liturgy, the services, were to be celebrated crisply and splendidly. This was a revelation at the time, because Mount Athos in the late 1970s was not a place where you wanted to go if you enjoyed the aesthetics of the Orthodox liturgy. Uh, liturgies in most of the services in most of the monastery churches were unendurable, monotone exercises in endurance. Simonopetra was in utter contest. The services were gorgeous, splendid. So liturgy was very much stressed, not simply in the fact of having it, but in its beauty, and thereby, I think, in good part, also its centrality. Because the second emphasis of Father Emilianos was the monks were to keep vigil in their cells alone through as much of the night as they could manage in order to arrive at the end of that vigil at the vision of God and heaven which the liturgy provides and is and communion of God and heaven. Now it was exactly that rhythm that movement into the liturgy and into the altar which the whole life of his monks followed and then everything coming out of the altar as it were and flowing into the life of the brotherhood. It was exactly in that rhythm that I recognized the solution to my the question regarding Dionysius that I clothed that I closed uh, with in answering uh, beginning to answer the question of his importance that is how does hierarchy fit with the, the immediate apprehension of God and the question is solved I think in good part by understanding the word hierarchy to mean fundamentally liturgy structured worship and not as something passive either clearly in Dionysius it's the image of heaven less clearly but just as uh, present it's also the image of the human being glorified so the entry into the altar is at the same time the entry into the heart And that brings us to mystical theology. What's meant by that phrase? Well, first, 
mystical in Greek doesn't mean what it means in English. Mystical in Greek, the word mystical means simply hidden. So what's hidden theology? Well, then that's the word that brings us to the word theology. What's that mean? And you might be surprised to learn that it has several meanings in Christian usage. It only has two in classical Greek. It means uh, philosophical discourse about divinity, which is how I think most of us understand it. Or it means stories about the birth of the gods like you find in the ancient poet Hesiod. But in Christian usage, it has several meanings. A kind of lowest meaning is rational or philosophical discourse about divinity, the, the pagan meaning. Two, it means scripture. Scripture is theology, and the scripture writers are the theologians, which is a locution that Dionysius uses constantly. Third, it means worship. The worship of the church in heaven and the worship of the church on earth. Fourth, theology means the vision of God. And fifth, theology means God, God's self in Trinity. So we move from Scripture to the, to the worship of God, to the vision of God within who is Trinity. Now, all of this was my key to reading the Dionysian Corpus, and I got it from Father Emilianos, less by anything that he said formally. I found all this in his writings later. But he communicated it simply in the, sh in the rhythms that he demanded of his monastery. And it percolated through to me via those rhythms. His pedagogy was never, never forced. Never even, or not, never even often direct or imposed, but kind of placed before you, and you are to take it. And then maybe a, a nudge or two, but no more. So I came to adore him. Um, and rightly, I think. His words, no, his words, which again I came to only later, resonate with me to the present day, and you can find them in English, a number of them. And I would heartily recommend that you avail yourselves of them. He is, I think, a contemporary father of the Church. Hi again, hope you enjoyed this episode from my interview with His Eminence Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn. Please leave a comment below letting me know what you thought of this video. And please subscribe below uh, so you can get notified the next time an episode becomes available, which happens every Friday. Have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you next week.